and the study ecosystems, mostly in the Arctic, but I've also done quite a bit of work um, in Northeast North America, so in, in the temp more temperate regions, particularly with woody plants. But I'm gonna be focusing on the um, Arctic this time. And these are two pictures of me uh, doing, oh, actually I forgot, because I have some other, um, uh, I forgot, because I have some, Ah, yes, so the top one is um, uh, at UBC at the greenhouse. We are uh, germinating a whole bunch of seeds that we collected in the Arctic uh, and seeing what the germination rate is. And the bottom one is of uh, me um, at Cape Bounty, the picture I showed you at the beginning, um, doing a species composition of, of plots out there that are behind a snow fence. So we're ch uh, checking out whether deeper snow or warmer conditions have an effect on the plant communities there. So do you have to work that fast? <laughs> Actually, it takes about two, at least two hours to do one, a uh, one meter plot. So uh, we had to speed it up. And that's it. You're only seeing half of the plot there because I then switched to the other side to do the other half of the plot. <laughs> um, so I love maps. Um, because it orientates me. So I just wanted to give you a map of the high Arctic and where I've been to. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Does anyone know where the geographic center of Canada is? <laughs> so it, it's actually about here, so near Baker Lake, right? So um, just to give you an idea of scale, I mean, Ottawa and Halifax aren't even on this map, right? <laughs> Um, so if I want to go and do my field sites, so these are all field sites I've been to. The first field site I went to was uh, for my PhD at Lake Hazen, which is at 82 degrees north. I managed to convince Parks Canada that I could help them with some phenology and climate change uh, work that they'd been monitoring. And I did, and I produced a paper from it. But so I managed somehow to get all the way up there in my first field season. But it's a long trip. Um, so from Ottawa, you take a nice cushy jet plane for three hours and you land in Iqaluit. Um, and then from there, it's about a four hour flight stopping at the milk run that stops at Pond Inlet, Arctic Bay and other places sometimes, depending on the day. Uh, and you land up um, at Resolute Bay and that's a flight of four hours on a prop jet plane. And then from there, we take chartered flights out to the field sites. So to get to Lake Hazen, that's another four hour flight on a twin otter plane, prop plane, um, stopping usually at Eureka and maybe tank refueled to refuel. So it's a two, three week trip maybe, because sometimes you get stuck in Resolute because it's foggy and you don't know what the weather's like up at your field site. So it, it can be a while before you get there. So it's a long journey to get from one end of the country to the north, from our southern location to the north. Um, I've also been to, um, I spent two summers at Alexandra Fjord um, and um, doing postdoc work there. I, in, and also at Cape Bounty last year, and I'm hoping to go back to Cape Bounty this year. I also went to Cambridge Bay one year too, um, which required a whole different process where you fly from Ottawa to Yellowknife and you have to spend a night in Yellowknife because the plane doesn't arrive in time for, to catch the plane up to Cambridge Bay, and then another trip into Cambridge Bay. So I've done work in both the Calouette and Cambridge Bay as well. Um, so this is the Twin Otter plane that we use to take um, our flights and, and depending on what time of year, it either has tundra tires on and we land on basically gravel, it, it kind of semi turns into a runway, but it's tundra basically you're landing on. And in the earlier months, um, we have what they call skids, which are kind of skis with still with a tundra wheel in there. And then we land on um, lake ice or, or sea ice or on the snow. Um, and this is what it looks like in the plane. So the left photo is looking forward and the pilots are in front. And then we have all of our luggage, which is everything. So there's, there's a propane tank for cooking. Um, there's fuel barrels for the plane fuel and uh, food and clothes and uh, science equipment, everything in there. And then we all squish at the back of the plane at the tail end, which is actually safer place to be, I think, 
<laughs> um, and so we're all squeezed at the back end of the plane. And then we get to sit back and relax and see the amazing scenery as we head further north. So this is the first year I went up there. This was 2013. It was probably the snowiest year I've ever seen up there and a super cold year. And I was kind of going, what am I doing here? This is, I'm supposed to be studying climate change and plants and then it's just snow. <laughs> so it was one of those super cold years of climate extreme. Um, yeah, and lots of glaciers. It's just an amazing flight um, to fly in. And so then um, when we get uh, there, the uh, plane drops us off and drops all of our gear. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the plane takes off down the runway. Well, the runway, this is the fjord of Ale Alexandria Fjord. Um, when, actually, when we landed, you, we did a circle around just to check that it's safe to land. And there were polar bear prints all over the Arctic. So the first thing we did was get out the, the gun when we landed. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I'll talk more about polar bears at the end. So that's uh, that was that's the plane leaving. And um, we are there for uh, four or five of us for a month. And no, no, the only contact with the outside world is by radio or, or satellite texting. And then the hard work begins, if I can get this to work, yes, um, of uh, hauling all of our belongings from the uh, middle of the fjord up um, across all of that jumble of uh, short ice there, um, up to the, the huts there. Um, so that was task number one. <laughs> all right. Um, and I thought I'd just give you an idea of kind of the places that I've stayed in. So this is um, at Katernapak National Park at Lake Hazen. Um, and the hut at the top there is an Atwell hut. It was put in there um, in 1957, 58 uh, for the International uh, Geophysical Year, I think it's called. Um, and um, it was funded mostly by the Defense Research Board. So it was kind of during uh, the Cold War area and um, ostensibly they were doing research, but obviously there was some sovereignty uh, and uh, military concerns going on as well. So that hut has been there since then. It's now a kitchen, um, probably the warmest building there. Um, I lucked out, well, maybe I lucked out, um, stayed in, um, some other um, semi-permanent huts in there. I had a bed and a, a diesel-fired stove and a, a window that faced north in the 24 allowed to the sun. I've stayed, uh, this is late, um, Alexandra Fjord again, where I um, saw the plane land and us hauling our stuff. This is an RCMP, an old RCMP post that was put in in 1953. Uh, it was um, going to be uh, the third uh, community up in the north, along with Resolute and Grease Fjord, where they forcibly moved Inuit um, from um, Hudson Bay and Pond Inlet up there. But they got um, the buildings in one year and brought the Inuit the next year, and they couldn't get in because there was too much ice. So the RCMP occupied it for 10 years till 1963, and eventually they moved out. But the buildings are there, and they've been maintained by um, a, um, by Joe Svoboda, who's from uh, University of Toronto, and then by Greg Henry, who's at the University of British Columbia. And they've just been doing their research out of those buildings. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the kitchen area. You can see this is the old coal burning stove that they used to use. We have um, uh, propane fired um, uh, stove there now, and the porch is the fridge. So that's where all the food go. Um, so, um, Okay, accommodation. And then um, at uh, Cape Bounty last year, I was camping for two months. So we had little tents. Um, there's a bare fence around there. It was kind of more for show, I think. Um, uh, and we didn't see any bears. Uh, and actually there, um, they seen um, grizzlies or um, the combination polar grizzlies, the roller or pizzly, whichever you want to call it. Uh, and this is the kind of the communal hut. It was pretty cramped. There's a table with a um, gas, a propane stove on it for um, six or seven people lined up in chairs along the side and the food is really all of our food for a month is in these bins here. Um, and the, the, uh, actually there, there was a big snowbank, so we dug a hole in it and put the coolers in there and that was our fridge for food. Yeah. 
Okay, so we've now arrived in the Arctic, but where is the Arctic? Um, you know, there are many definitions. Um, obviously, the north of the Arctic Circle is the obvious one. Um, you could say um, further south than that, where there's uh, daylight that you can see, civil twilight for 24 hours, which is a little bit earlier. Uh, my scientific ones, uh, like um, we often do the um, boundary, the red dotted line there, that's where the temperature is below 10 degrees C on the warmest month of the year, so in July. Um, so north of that squiggly red line is where it doesn't, typically the temperature doesn't get above 10 degrees C in July. And then there's also above the tree line, um, which is um, fairly close to that uh, 10 degree th C uh, uh, thermal isotherm. But the question is why? If you look at this closely, you can see that this side the, is much higher than on the other side. And that's because um, of Hudson Bay, basically. It's a huge expanse of sea ice that brings that temperature down and makes it cooler on, on our side, on the Canadian side of, of the Arctic. So that um, Arctic is much further south and the tree line is much further south around the Hudson Bay. I haven't promised I don't have too many graphs in there here, but um, I wanted to just give you an idea of the temperatures and the precipitation in the Arctic. So this is actually uh, data from Tank Reef Fjord. They have a weather station there in the park, and I just plotted the uh, monthly temperatures um, for the year. So one is January up to 12 being December. Um, so in the winter, the coldest months, January, February, it's minus 30 to minus 40 degrees. And it's a pretty steady temperature. It doesn't fluctuate too much, actually. It's a pretty steady temperature. Then it rapidly rises in about May to, to getting above freezing sometime in June, um, towards the end of June. Uh, and uh, in, by July, it barely touches 10 degrees C. And then by August, early August, really, um, the temperatures start dropping again. And so you have um, a very cold, a very short growing season, is a very cool summer and a very cold winter. Um, it's also super dry up there. Um, the annual precipitation at the very north of um, Ellesmere Island is less than 50 millimeters of precipitation a year. You can't really measure it very well because the snow is so um, like polystyrene balls, it's very hard to measure and it blows around everywhere. Um, so you usually equate one center of meter of snow to one millimeter of precipitation. Um, so above the Arctic, uh, in the Kaluit further south, it's about 400 millimeters precipitation. Just to give you an idea, here in, around in Nova Scotia, in Halifax, I believe, um, annual precipitation is about 1,400. So just to give you an idea of how, how dry it is. So it's a polar, what we call a polar desert up there. Super, super dry. So even though it's so cold up there, it's an amazing how many different plant species there are there. So up uh, in Lake Hazen, there are 125 vascular plant species. That doesn't include the mosses and lichens. Um, in Alexandra Fjord, these most, actually all the three, um, all but one of those pictures are from Alexandra Fjord. Um, and there's about 110 different uh, vascular plant species, including ferns as well. Um, so it's a amazing variety of species. I mean, compared to down here, it's pretty small, but still that far north under such uh, extreme conditions, there are still a lot of different species. But if you notice, they're all very low, right? I mean, really, you're not seeing much growing above this sort of height. Um, so why is that? So. The reason is it's actually much warmer down here. Um, and I, I didn't believe that at first. I've been told that it was like 10 or 15 degrees warmer down near the ground than up where they measure the temperature at 1.5 meters. So I did a MacGyver experiment. I got a pipe, a, a bit of PVC piping. I put it in the ground. It was only one meter high, but I thought, well, it's close enough. 
and I put a mounted a thermistor on the top of it, and then I stuck another one um, about you know on a tent peg in the ground, so it was about five centimeters off the ground. Um, so the blue line is the five centimeter one, the the lower to the ground, and the green line is the um, one at one meter. So it actually is warmer down the ground, and there's two reasons for that. The first is that um, the uh, radio, the sun uh, comes down, it's a lot of bare ground, it's absorbed by the ground, and then it's re-radiated back up. So you have extra heat from that. And the second reason is there's a boundary layer of still air. So if you think about the wind chill that you experience, um, so it makes up there, it makes it a lot colder, but there's a still layer of air close to the ground that doesn't move. So it makes it a lot warmer. You don't have that wind chill factor. So that is, I think, some of the main reasons why those plants are small. It's really quite warm down there. I mean, you've got temperatures almost at 20, and this is in mid-June. I uh, By July, I saw I was recording temperatures five centimeters off the ground that were above 25 degrees C. So, so it's pretty warm, eh? The other thing that plants have to contend with is um, a nutrient-poor environment. Um, so it's... Uh, Temperatures are low, the growing season is short, so there's not really very much time for the plant material to, or anything to decompose. And you can see across the landscape, you see these big green, bright green, taller patches. Um, and you can bet your boots that it's going to be something like a fox's den or um, a lemming condo or... Um, uh, a bird perch or a dead carcass because those are adding extra nutrients in there and so you find taller greener plants and often a different plant community than you would see elsewhere on the tundra. So the, um, there are a number of strategies that these plants use to deal with this colder and shorter growing season. The first is they form these beautiful little cushions out there, almost hemispherical, they're really cute. Um, and that creates a little microclimate. It also means that it retains any leaves that it loses. Um, it keeps those nutrients because it's expensive if you don't, if you're in a nutrient poor environment, it's expensive to make new leaves. So they often retain their leaves for multiple years as well to try and um, compensate for that. They are what we call xeromorphic, which is zero meaning dry and morphic meaning shape. Um, and th this is a common trait with um, plants from desert as well. So they have, as I said earlier, that it's a very dry environment, but that also helps them with keeping warm as well. So um, they have um, long hairs or succulent. Um, some of them are evergreen. And the, the one on the left there is, I think is really cool. So what you see is the plant, the older leaves close up around the newer leaves in the winter. And you land up with this ball with older, tougher leaves on the outside, protecting the newer, greener leaves on the inside. And then it opens up in the spring and then it closes back in the winter. So they... <clears throat> It's really neat to see the flowers, especially the things like the poppies and even the mountain avens there, and they rotate with the sun. So they have they actually keep, rotate around 24, 360 degrees, just following the sun. Um, not sure, I don't know that we really understand why, but some hypotheses are that um, pollinators, I mean, I've got two pictures there where we've got insects um, sitting there in the nice warmth of the, the, you know, the trapped warm air from the, um, the flowers, or possibly just to help with uh, getting the seeds to ripen and mature. It's just warmer in there. Yeah. Another uh, strategy, which actually we see a lot down here, is that the flower buds are preformed the year before. Um, so these uh, one, the top one is of the purple saxifrage, and the bottom one is the white heather. Actually, the purple saxifrage, I believe, grows in um, Cape Breton. There's quite a few of the Arctic species that actually grow, still grow in the, some of the regions in Cape Breton. Um, these are tiny. Um, I took those pictures with um, digital microscopes, so we're looking at something that's less than a millimeter in a, a point one of a millimeter in diameter. And the one on the, the, the right there is of, of a willow opening up there, a little bit bigger, and those are above the ground. So most of these buds are either just below the ground, as you find for perennials down here, 
um, or um, on your typical woody plant bud as well. But they form them the year before so that as soon as the spring arrives the next year, they can open their flowers and they get pollinated and produce seeds in that very, very short growing season. So they um, also do what we call produce live young, especially if the plants that flower late in the season, they have a secondary strategy to reproduce veget what we call vegetatively. So they produce live clones. So the two on the right there, the alpine bistoid and the nodding saxophage, they produce um, along their flowering stem. Um, sometimes the flowering stem doesn't even have a flower on it. It just has these bulb, what we call bulbils. And so they're just like tiny little plants or even like a bulb in a way you can put them take them off the plant and put them in water and they'll produce a clone of the parent flower. Uh, the, um, the spider plant um, does I think it should be called the strawberry plant actually because it produces runners with little baby plants at the end just as a strawberry does wherever those land you, you'll get um, another plant so you land up with a bigger plant and then a whole bunch of littler plants the babies all around the big one. Um, and the, uh, particularly the grasses and sedges um, produce uh, what we call ramets. So there's a, um, uh, a root that goes underground and then the, another plant comes up a bit further down. This is the semaphore grass. This is a one, I'm not very good with IDing grasses, but this one is easy to ID and it's really beautiful purple color and it's um, floret, the uh, inflorescences kind of do this semaphore thing. Most of the Arctic plants produce dry fruits and uh, wind dispersed seeds. It's very expensive to, um, requires a lot of energy and nutrients to produce fruit. So there are fruits um, up there, so blueberries and cranberries grow, but the vast majority of them are um, uh, produce dry fruits that burst open when they dry. Um, what you also see is the flower um, flowering stem gets taller and taller as the fruit matures. And so then the stem is taller and then it gets waved by the wind, which will then help with uh, dispersing those seeds. Okay, um, so that's a little bit of background on plants and how they survive up in the Arctic. I wanted to just give you a couple of slides on climate change and with particularly on focus on the Arctic. So, um, this is a, um, a view of the globe generated by NOAA and NASA. You can, it's a cool website um, where you can just put in the year, uh, start year, end year, and uh, whether you want monthly or year annual or whatever, or seasonal, and it will generate this map showing you how much the temperature has changed over that period. So I chose 1947 because that is actually the year that we started recording temperatures up in the Canadian Arctic, and that coincides with post-war, Second World War, and the start of the Cold War. So there was definitely some links there. So we have more consistent um, temperature records starting from 1947, so that's why I chose that year, and then 75 years on is 2022. Um, so blue means it's getting colder over the years, red means it's getting hotter. And so you can see that the annual temperatures in the Arctic are actually getting um, are, are rising by about triple the average global rate. So over those 75 years, the temperature globally has risen by about a degree. Um, if you at the top there, it's really bright red and it's like three or more degrees that the temperature has risen. So the, there's a number of reasons for that related to air and um, ocean circulations that amplifies and feedback loops that um, cause that to happen. If you dissect that a little bit further into seasons, you see something that's really quite interesting to me anyway. Um, autumn and winter temperatures in the Arctic are rising uh, more, more than the, the summer and uh, spring and summer temperatures, where it's the opposite in temperate regions, where you're seeing that the summer temperatures are rising more than the winter and autumn temperatures. So a little window into climate change um, in the Arctic. So I talked a little bit about phenology. Um, so I wanted to give a bit more background on that. So phenology is the study of the timing of nature's seasonal events. So for instance, the arrival of migratory birds, 
the emergence of insects. Oh, it's gone on to autopilot. Okay. Um, how do I go back? Um, I spoke too slow, I guess. Um, <laughs> and uh, and the timing of flowering and leaf out, um, and the seed dispersal and leaf, leaf senescence or leaf fall, leaf color, those sorts of things. Um, so they're all um, related to their seasonal. So there's um, part of that is related to temperature. Um, so for plants in particular, they have a mechanism where they, you can think of it as they have an internal threshold. And when the temperature is above that threshold, then it adds another bead on the counter to their species specific number of days. And then once they've got that count, so the number of days above a certain temperature has been long enough, then they'll initiate flowering and leaf out. And that's a mechanism the plants use to prevent them from flowering or leafing out in the middle of the winter during a warm week, say. So it's, an, um, but obviously that with climate change, that means that they, uh, it has an effect on the climate as well. Or well, the climate has an effect on them, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, by measuring the plant responses and phenology, there are many ways you can do that. Uh, some of the ways I've used is a long-term monitoring. So you go out and you record that the time that the plant was flowering year after year after year um, until you build up a data set. And that's what um, uh, they were doing at um, uh, Tankery Fjord and, and in Parks Canada and Alexandra Fjord. They've been doing that too. Um, another interesting way is using herbarium specimens. So herbarium specimens are pressed plants that botanists and naturalists have been collecting since, um, since we, well, for my purposes, for at least the 1900s, they've been doing a good job of this because what they do normally is record where the plant was collected and when it was collected. And they usually collect it when it's in flower. So you then have this kind of time series of when that plant was flowering over the last century or more. Um, an interesting way that we've been doing uh, climate change research, and this is at Alexandra Fjord, is to put what we call um, open top chambers, which um, experimentally warm a plot. So they're six sided perspex panels that kind of lean inwards and they warm the area inside that um, uh, open top chamber by about one to three degrees C. So basically you're simulating climate change. So then in one year, you can compare what happens to plants outside the warm chamber and plants inside the chamber. And you usually see that there will be a difference in the flowering times. Uh, and over time, you actually start seeing differences in, in the species plant composition between the two plots as well. So my phenology monitoring, um, what I tend to do is I go out, I want to look at a whole bunch of different species. So I'll go out and I'll tag specific plants of that species. And then I will go back every, say, three days and count the number of flowers on that plant. And I do that for ideally for at least 30 plants of one species and multiple sites, um, locations at my field site. Um, so that's a lot of plants flower counting. Um, I have one year when, with a field assistant and I designed her the um, heather, arctic heather to count, and there were thousands of flowers. So in the end, I put rocks around it and go, oh, you only need to measure this little bit of it. It was just so many to climb. Um, so then if you've got that count, you know when the plant started flowering, you know when it was in peak flower, and you know when it finished flowering. And actually, it's kind of, um, it's not a rounded thing, it tends to be that the peak is uh, reached within the first third. So there's a very rapid opening of flowers and then a tailing off of a few flowers um, opening for quite some time after that peak has happened. So the, the phenology monitoring does have its challenges, especially in the Arctic. The first thing is trying to find these plants. So that um, the, the um, pygmy um, Rock jasmine is a primula plant. I mean, it's the size of my thumbnail, right? It's tiny. Um, and so it's really quite hard if you don't know what you're looking for to actually find some of these plants. Um, once you've found them, then you kind of get that search engine in and then you start seeing them everywhere. So that's the first challenge. The second one is some of the animals, um, lovely as they are, <laughs> 
like eating the plants. <laughs> so the muskox, for example, uh, had a penchant for these um, palaces wallflower, the purple flowers. And the bunnies would you'd walk up to your field site and actually you'd see they pull out the tags so you'd see the tags you put in pull out. Um, and, and with a big green on them faces that are eating your the, the poppies. I have um mole muskox molar marks on some of the plant tags I have as well. So they would chew the tags as well. Yeah. <laughs> But I usually got enough that I did lots of sites with lots of plants. So even if they did eat a few, I still had enough by doing my data analysis. Um, so I mentioned that the plants are um, the flowering and the leaf at times are um, this didn't work out quite as I expected. So maybe I'll just do that. Okay, so um, top half, what I'm saying is that with warmer temperatures, plants tend to flower and leaf out earlier. Um, so there's that relationship between flowering time and temperature. So if the climate is getting warmer, what we're likely to see is that um, flowering and leaf out times tend to shifting earlier. And you see this down here, right? You see that on warm years, things start greening up earlier. So I think this year we're gonna see things happening earlier than other years, right? So um, typically we're seeing about a day per decade, um, a day per decade earlier flowering and leafing out um, it, both in the Arctic and temperate regions. So over that 75 year, year period down here, you're gonna see about a shift of a week over 75 years in the Arctic, obviously it's gonna be closer to three weeks, right? So then you start seeing how um, big those changes could be. The Arctic um, plants have a hard time re being reproductively successful. So this um, is a study from uh, Svalbard um, seed bank. So in Svalbard is an um, island north of um, Norway, um, quite a way north. I think it's 74, 75 degrees north and it's pretty high up. And they built this tunnel into the permafrost and they're storing all of these seeds, mostly um, uh, crops crop seeds as a backup should there be a disaster. And so it's a uh, um, seed bank, um, but they also have some Arctic plants. So there was a study done that uh, tried to germinate about 79 species that were collected from Svalbard. Um, and the germination rate I calculated on average was about 35%. So if you bought a packet of seeds to, you know, your tomato seeds and only 35% of them germinated, you would probably not be too happy, right? Um, so the germination rate of or the seed viability of the um, other Arctic plants is actually quite low. Um, what we also see is that if the seeds are put in a really nice warm environment, a lot more of them will germinate. So this line here is on ideal conditions, nice and warm indoors, and these are successively less um, uh, good ideal conditions. So then you see less and less of the seeds actually germinating. So what does this all mean? Um, so what we think will have as you know, and see what's happening is that with warmer temperatures, you tend to see more flowers being produced, uh, more fruits and berries uh, being produced. We get tend to see bigger, heavier seeds being produced in warmer conditions. And we see both more viable seeds, so the number of seeds that the plant produces more of them are able to, to germinate. Uh, and we also see a higher germination rate of those seeds because it's warmer environments. So ideally, uh, you know, I think we should be seeing an increase in reproductive success of the plants. I'm not gonna go into this today, but we've actually, because of these interannual and climate extremes, we're not actually always seeing that though. The last part about the warming is um, species composition. So, um, and we've done some experiments with these open top chambers and measured the, uh, or recorded what plant species are growing in the warmed plots versus cold plots. And we've done this over multiple years at Alexandra Fjord. That goes back uh, tw over 25 years now, we have data from there. And what we're seeing is that some species are becoming more dominant. So we, we term it shrub, shrubification. So the willows are taking off. So they really like the warm um, conditions. So they're getting taller and bigger and wider. 
And they're basically out competing some of the other species. So the purple saxifrage, for example, doesn't like the competition. So they, we're seeing a lot less of them in those plots than we did before. It's also out competing the lichen. So we're seeing a decrease in the lichen. And the lichen is one of the preferred foods of caribou. So it has an impact up the food chain from some of these changes. So we're seeing, I think, probably less di diversity in the um, plant species composition than we were in the past with some species becoming more dominant. All right, um, enough on plants and climate change. I thought I would just finish up. Well, actually, a few slides on, um, on the, the, the animals and the birds. Um, I used to be a member of the Young Ornithologist Club in, uh, in the UK, so I have a passion for birds, so I wanted to start with the birds first. Um, I went The first time I went up to Lake Hazen, um, obviously we we're limited for weight and I was trying to figure out what things I really didn't need to take there. So I opened my little bird book. It was one of the Peterson guides, which actually has a distribution map that actually includes Northern Ellesmere Island. Mm -hmm. So I went flipped through and I counted which birds actually got that far north. And I came to about 20. I went, okay, I don't really need the guidebook. I think I can figure this out. And the bird, so if it's a turn, it's an Arctic turn, right? There's only one turn that's up there. So I can ID a turn that all the different turns are sometimes hard to identify but it's going to be an arctic turn if it's a turn and uh, there's about three or four waders uh, which are all very easy to distinguish them from one another so like the ruddy turnstone the red knot um bed sandpiper and sandling a bit harder to distinguish between and i'm missing one um but they're all pretty easy to distinguish between um, so some of these are the birds that I've seen. Um, there's um, rock ptarmigans up there. They're one of the few birds that uh, stay there all winter. They have feathers on their feet and they survive all winter. The males keep their white plumage all summer, whereas the uh, females just turn to a brown um, guest to make them less visible while they're looking after the chicks that run around with them. I've seen huge, like 10, um, 10 15 chicks um, from one. Yeah. Um, snow geese, um, reasonably common up there. We're beginning to see a lot more Canada geese up there as well. Um, that's the parasitic Jaeger there. Both the parasitic Jaeger and the Arctic tern are, are real dive bombers. We walk around with uh, walking sticks or anything held above your head to keep them from diving on you. <clears throat> I've only seen the red phalarope rope once uh, up there, and it was only in this one pond for a couple of days. And it was clearly, and this is at Lake Hayes, and so 82 degrees north, and it was still heading further north. Um, the uh, gear falcon, this is a white, um, the white morph, I guess, uh, blue morph, I can't remember how to call it. Um, and uh, there was a nest at Alexandra Fjord out on Hunt Island. There's a big cliff there. Um, when we visited, when we could get across on the sea ice and walk there, there were two eggs in the nest. And when we went by in a boat a few months later, there were two chicks um, with um, hanging out on the cliff face. Um, the red-throated loon, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit more about. And this is the ho hoary red pole, um, which um, we, we get up in the high Arctic. <coughs> so no trees, so everything nests on the ground up there um and they're hard to see i mean you can almost step on the nest but you kind of at the last minute the the bird will fly off and you usually see where the nest is so the one on the left there um in amongst the arctic heather there is the uh, bear sandpiper and that's the eggs from that nest so it's just a little depression in the ground um that they line with um with uh, leaves from, actually, I think they're mountain avens leaves there. Um, and the uh, common ringed plover there, it just made a depression in the gravel. And if you look in the nest, the, the gravel bits are smaller inside the nest. Um, so they all, almost all of them do what I call the broken and wing impression. So when you get close to the nest, the adult gets off the nest and, and leads you away with a broken wing, right? So it's trying to draw you away from the nest. Um, most of the um, of the chicks are um, precochial, uh, which means that they are born with feathers and able to run within a few hours of 
uh, hatching. So basically the parents then have this mighty difficult time as these chicks just <laughs> run off the boat over the tundra in all sorts of directions and you hear them going, Doo! trying to keep corral these chicks. So pretty much they're on their own from um, day one um, up there. But it makes sense, right? Because, you know, they're on nesting on the ground, open to all sorts of predators. Um, the red-throated loon uh, is, an, I don't know, I have a soft spot for this bird. Um, and there were a lot, quite a few pairs of them up at Lake Hazen. They tend to nest on little islands, clumps that are in the middle of the lake, um, which obviously is a, um, helps them be protected from um, uh, a predators. The chicks are born super late. So this those two pictures were chicks were um, uh, taken in August. So they're really young. And one year there was a, an albino one as well. So. Um, <laughs> And they have, if I can get this to work, they have the most mournful sound. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, I guess the sound. No, I... Okay, well, go go on to Dendronica or somewhere and you can hear this. So it's a really mournful, almost like a cat sound. Very different from your other loons. <clears throat> Okay, um, so a couple of years ago, um, I was able to go to Cambridge Bay and I arrived um, during the freshet. Um, so that's when all of the ice starts melting and the streams start flowing. And um, I just hit it at the right time. And there's this cacophony of noise from the birds. Um, and I saw, um, in that summer, I saw 11 new species of birds that I'd not seen in the Arctic before or anywhere, actually. Um, so um, the top left one is the red-necked phalarope and the Sabine skull, and they were in these little ponds and ru running, the, the red-necked uh, phalaropes go around in circles, it's really amazing to see. Uh, the tundra swan, a white-fronted geese, um, the, um, let me get this correct, is the uh, stilt sandpiper, um, eider ducks, and, and the uh, American golden plover. So all of those were new birds that I hadn't seen before. And there was just for maybe a week when the birds were flying through. Um, and so there was this ton of birds in a very concentrated, right in, in the community of Cambridge Bay. And then after about a week, they all dispersed out to their uh, nesting sites. I think the two coolest birds that I saw there were the um, uh, Sandhill Crane. Uh, it's, a bird, it's a bird that I wanted to see for a long time. And so I got to see them uh, in Cambridge Bay and the, the yellow-billed loon, which is quite rare, I think. Um, the sand hill crane actually likes to hang out at the local dump, so it, it went down in my <laughs> steam a little bit after that. Uh, so there are about seven land mammals that uh, live up in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic hare, we affectionately know them, call them bunnies. Um, and um, it's interesting in the summer, for, in the high Arctic, they keep their white fur all year, so they don't change. Whereas further south, so around the Kaluit and southern uh, Baffin Island, they actually change their coat to being a, a brown coat in the summer. Um, the Arctic fox, on the other hand, um, does change its coat. So the one picture on the right is of um, at Lake Hazen with a fox just about to lose its white coat. And the um, one in the center is, is a young female fox at uh, Alexandra Fjord in its, its summer coat. Um, the wolf, um, it keeps its uh, white coat all year round. Um, the musk ox uh, does lose its fur. Um, so you can kind of see it's losing it. The, the musk ox actually has two types of fur. So it has these long, thick, wiry um, guard hairs, which kind of you know, it's like your Gore-Tex jacket, a windproof jacket. And then underneath that is what, um, in Inuktitut, I don't know the word in English for it, is kuvit, um, which is a really soft downy fur and that keeps them warm. Um, and so they lose that um, every year, grow a new coat. I've never actually seen a caribou up in the Arctic. I've just seen their, um, 
uh, their uh, antlers on the ground. They're not um, in, at that height. It's the Piri caribou, and they're you know very small uh, groups of, of them up there. Um, and there's a couple of small mammals, so the um, uh, ermine and the uh, oh, um, lemming. Um, that I've seen. I've never seen either of the, the lemmings are supposed to, you know, they have a bust and boom, so they, they have big populations and then you get snowy owls coming in and I've never it's been able to be in the right place to see that. So I've only ever seen the odd lemming here and there. And I've only seen the ermine once in around Halloween and that's its summer plumage in the winter. It, it's all white with a black tip to the tail. I think the musk ox is probably one of my favorite. Um, when you, um, if you walk by them, they form this semi protective semicircle and it just moves with them. <laughs> and so you look and you go, well, it's still the same view. It's like the Mona Lisa eyes, right? They just, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, you see them, it was, it's like the Arctic safari. So in a Lake Hazen, we'd be sitting outside on a nice day and you just see a herd of muskox just kind of go by in the distance. It has that Arctic safari look to it. Um, and last year, uh, I got up one early morning and looked at my tent and there was this herd of muskox. Uh, probably the biggest herd I've seen, um, about good, over a dozen, with uh, three young amongst them as well. And they were right by our tents. And so I got up, I got my camera out, and then someone else got up, and everyone got up one by one, and, and like, oh, wow, these mascots right close by. So it was really quite special to see them so close by. Um, um, and we saw that herd for a day or two and then they moved on and then we'd see other groups or individuals come. The, the males tend to be older males and he will just wander off and they'll be just on their own um, uh, when they get older, yeah. Um, so the Arctic wall, uh, wolves, um, when I first went up to Lake Hayes and I'd heard them howling and I we saw a fleeting glimpse of one going by um, the first year I was there, and that was about uh, it. Um, there were these paw prints there, so I, we knew that they were around. Um, the third year I was up there, um, me and my field assistant were heading out for the day, and I saw something white in the distance, and then over the horizon came came a wolf, and then another one, and another one, and another one. And it was a pack of seven wars that were just going by. And I mean, it was pretty impressive to see them, you know, a couple of hundred yards away from me. Um, but I think what was more impressive was to see them go across the landscape. So I don't know if you can see, but there, 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 there. That's the, uh, the um, pack walk going across the landscape. That took them like five minutes to go across that huge piece of landscape for me to walk on there. And I'm a, I was a pretty fast walker. That would take me 15, 20, 30 minutes to walk that distance. So they just fly across there and they were not running. They just ambling along, it seems. So obviously out for a hunt. Um, and last year uh, at Cape Bounty, um, we knew there were um, walls around, there were footprints in the snow and a bit of poop here and there. Um, and then again, when I got up well, early one morning, I saw this guy here, you can see it's a guy, with, um, um, one day, and uh, then we saw the female. So there was a, a pair of walls and we don't know where that then is, but obviously within walking walking distance of our camp. And we would see them periodically through the, out the whole season we were there. I suspect they came through almost every day, but if you didn't happen to be out and about when they went through, you probably miss them. But pretty impressive. They're, they're curious, um, but a little wary. So, um, uh, but really cool to see. Okay. So um, I had the reputation of being the bear deterrent. I'd been up to the Arctic for many years and I'd never seen a polar bear. My first year at Alexandra Fjord, which has, a, um, has had a bit of a bear problem in the past. The first year I was there, we saw no bears at all. Um, and then the second year, that was the year that I flew in on, I showed you fly, that we flew in on, onto the ice and we saw all the footprints on. 
Um, for the whole of June, it was like, oh, another day, another bear. I think we saw a total of 17 bears in, in under a month. Um, and they were all different bears. And most of them were, all of them were mums with cubs or young females. Um, so the, the, this is a video of me, um, of, of um, uh, mum with two uh, cubs that were born in the winter that year. Um, so they were, uh, most of them were way out on the ice. There's lots of seals out there. Um, so they have plenty of food. So they're happy bears. Um, we only have a very few of them actually come into camp. So this is a mum with two yearlings. So the cubs were born the year before and the, the cubs were kind of interested. They were way out on the ice. They heard noise and sm probably smelled us a bit too. And so they came in to take a look and we let them come into the jumbled ice below our camp. And then we went, okay, that's close enough and just fired a bear banger and off they went at a rapid rate. Um, this one was, is a young female, so we had to actually come in, into camp. Um, you, you look at the window and go, oh, hello. <laughs> um, and so we would go out as a group and just basically rush them and they would run away um, and then fire a bear banger to send home the message. So, uh, and uh, the... Um, Walruses also were in Alexandra Fjord, so they were a little quieter. Um, so the top left hand left hand photo there is of that they dive for clams, and when they come up, they go, and you can hear this sound. This very it's very therapeutic. You just hear this, and you know that the the walrus has come up. Um, and occasionally they would, a group of them would float in on a, a pile of ice. Um, and uh, we could hear this dog sound noise from afar somewhere. Um, and we took a boat out to an island in the fjord um, and went across, walked across the island. And on the far side of the island, we could see this rock here with probably a hundred or more uh, walruses hauled out on that. The funny thing is when we took the boat back, everyone's going, yeah, ooh. and everyone else could smell these boxes, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, and that is actually the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Yes, yes. Can you, you can repeat the question? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so I. <laughs> any questions, please? Mm. Yes, uh, Alison. Can you share a recipe with me? Can I share local knowledge from here? So, the question is um, Do you have a, much interaction with the Inuit and um, their knowledge? Um, so, not as much as I would like. Um, most of my field sites are well outside the communities. Um, and I, so I actually lived in Iqaluit for years. I uh, worked at Parks Canada for years. So I got to interact with them a little bit through work there. Um, and when I was in Cambridge Bay, um, that community is almost entirely Inuit. Um, so I got to interact and work with them a little bit there too. Um, so I'm interested in their in their knowledge and we had some great exchanges i wish it was more but um yeah so a little bit um you know so you you hear um them talking about how things are changing up there um so for instance in halloween uh, they say that it's much greener there than it used to be um and yeah so little and i think to me the bits that have been most interesting for me as a plant person is what they use the plants for. So they tell you a lot about what um, uh, what they traditionally have used the plants for. But it's a t in Cambridge Bay, um, so whenever I went out to the field, I, it, for safety reasons, if nothing else, you always go with someone. And so that was always an Inuit from the community. And um, they would help me with my research, but we had lots of great exchanges I would talk about what I knew from a scientific point of view, Western science point of view, and they would tell me what they knew from uh, um, from their traditional um, view as well. Yes. 
you see with the climate change up there? Many invasive species coming up from so. So the question is, uh, do you see any, with climate change, do you see any invasive species coming up? And actually, uh, so far, no. Um, so um, there, I think there's kind of this barrier of the, you know, uh, especially on the Arctic islands, um, it, that's, you know, so there's sea ice between the mainland and the islands. So we're not really seeing anything like we're getting new records of species there, but they've probably been there the whole time. It's just people haven't seen them. So, for instance, I worked the, as a postdoc at the Canadian Museum of Nature and the botany team up where it was up in Sopa River a few years before, and they found a fern and an orchid species that had never been recorded for that site. But they're almost sure that they have been there. It's just we didn't see them. Um, at Alexandra Fjord, we've actually... Uh, so. Um, they transplanted some plants from mainland. Well, you've seen those, Nick, right? Um, and they planted them up at Alexandra Fjord. So we're talking, they transplanted them 20 degrees further north, and they're growing 20, 30 years down the road. They're still growing, they're still flowering, but there's no other plants. So it's just the same plants that they transplanted. So they've not, so we don't really understand why they can survive up there, but not really multiply. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Nick. Yeah. You mentioned that there was a very great temperature differences or climatic differences year to year. And when we were in Alexandra, Fjord, there were no animals. We saw one, so we were just there for two months. We saw one lemming. <laughs> and a piece of a piece of um, canvas which was spindled at the end, and the piece of canvas had all been all had gone through a fox. Well, we never saw a fox. <laughs> right. So it was just a wipeout. Yeah, so I have to say that Alexandra Fjord is probably where I've seen the least number of animals. Um there I don't know why. So there's no Mark Scox there. We did see the fox. So we had a, a, a animal trap camera up. So there's a fox den up at Alexandra Fjord. Um, and so we put a, a camera trap up there. And so we would, interestingly enough, we would see, first we'd see the bunny hopping by and, we, and eating right in front of the fox den. We're going, no, this Probably not, but it, it, it's it, it's got. Um, you'll see the bunnies wherever there's extra um, greenery growing, right? So it, the, obviously the fox then produces a nice nutrient-rich food for the bunny, um, and then we'd see the fox occasionally. Um, I I we did helicopter surveys um, of the muskox in some valleys nearby. Um, and so there are muskox out there, but they just don't come into Alexandra Fjord. I mean, I, I think um, from all the explorers that were up there many 200 years earlier, um, they killed a lot of them. So we think that some, that may be that the populations of the muskox are, are much lower than they probably used to be up there. Um, so, yeah. Um, so it, it's a beautiful, I mean, Alexandra Field is a beautiful valley, glacial valley, and quite rich in, in plants. Um, uh, but um, not that busy life oh, uh, animal wise on the land but out on the sea there's tons of seal on the sea as of seals and walruses and um a polar bears yeah any other questions yes i'm curious about the, the pollinators for the flowers are there sufficient population the question is, uh, what are the pollinators up there? Are there enough of them? So um, there have been studies that are done and um, most of the pollinators are actually in the fly flam family, mosquitoes, right? Uh, so the pollination is mostly by uh, flies. There are two bee species that I know of up there. Um, uh, one is a huge, I mean, they're huge anyway, they're matte and you see this, they're solitary bees. Uh, and so you'll see the queen bee in the early spring bouncing around and it's this massive blob. Um, and there's a smaller bee, um, which I believe parasitize, also a solitary bee that I believe parasitizes the, the larger bee. So there are a couple of bee species. Um, there are some uh, moths up there too, but most of the pollination is actually from, uh, uh, from the flies. 
that's why actually why you I mean you don't see any red flowers up there because the red flowers are typically pollinated by birds so you'll only see the purple and yellow and um ones with the ultraviolet so, um so the, for the insect pollination yeah um another question there yeah. you see fungi species up there uh, so the question is, do you see fungi? Yes. Um, there's, uh, we actually, uh, oh, I don't know. I have a picture. We collected a bunch of different ones, uh, probably half a dozen different species, um, and one or two of them we actually fried up and ate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Puff, actually, puffballs. So the Inuit uh, will collect and eat those, the puffballs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, has the four degree temperature change resulted in any dramatic? consequences up there then. Well, yeah, the, sorry, uh, there's actually, oh yeah, sorry. Um, has the four degree rise in temperature um, resulted in any consequences in that there? So I think um, one of the biggest ones is, is um, the loss of sea ice, right? So the sea ice is um, uh, leaving earlier and forming later. Uh, so once you've got open ocean, that means the heat can absorb it and make it nice and warm, which means it takes it longer to freeze up again in the winter, which also means that you have less multi-year ice. So you land up in this negative feedback loop, right? So every year, and you uh, you probably, some of you seen the maps where they show the minimum sea ice extent in September, and you look at where it is now compared to the average over the previous 30 years, and it's quite small. Um, so that affects the seals and polar bears because, you know, the seals haul out onto the ice um, to breathe and they have their pups up there. The polar bears use the ice to go hunt for the seals. So what they then see um, and some um, researchers um, at um, NWRC, um, so Environment Climate Change Canada, have been studying the eider ducks on islands in Hudson Bay. And they're now finding the polar bears are coming onto the land because the sea ice is gone and they will completely decimate that eider duck colony. And those eider ducks are a source of income and food for the Inuit in some of the local communities. And it's basically not even safe to be on those islands. They have to come off early because that. So, so, so those are some of the more dramatic ones. I mean, uh, we're seeing changes in the caribou herd size. Um, the evidence I don't think is entirely clear as to whether that's a natural, so they go through their natural uh, high and low cycles. Um, whether that's linked to climate change, is it because we have shrubification and there's less lichen for them to eat? I don't think we fully understand or know that answer, but so those are some of the bigger impacts. The plants are definitely changing, so we definitely see this shrubification going on and that has other implications, but it's a slow process, right? You need to see that change for a long time to be able to be sure that it's a change and not a, just one year difference from another. Yeah. Was there a question back there? I think I saw a hand. We have got a question on Zoom. Though. Okay, yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. Great. Your flower photos, could you remind us what months those are generally taken in? Thank you so much for the presentation. Okay, uh, so okay, do I need to repeat that? No. <laughs> so the flower photos are usually taken. So the first flowers come out towards the end of June, and the last flowers are there um, out at the end of July, maybe the first of August. So you really have about a month and a half of flowering time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, John. May I ask the bird a question? Yes, you may. Yes, uh, I will try and answer. Uh, okay, uh, I've heard now that our robin did a calendar, and uh, the commissioner of the Nunavut uh, was speaking in Acadia, and he was in there. But, uh, uh, so they're coming up there, and there's no trees or anything. But other migratory birds, uh, their timing of their migration is changing. And uh, they have to correlate with the food for having their chicks and or their laying eggs and all mm -hmm. that. That food has to be available. Have you seen any of this lack of correlation uh, in the Arctic? I haven't personally, and I I mean it, it. I don't think we have as good records as down here as to when the birds are arriving. But there's definitely evidence about potential mismatches. I can talk about a Colorado uh, study that they've done, but 
Um, before I go there, I, what I was going to say. So there was one year in Greenland um, in 2018, you remember I said that, so it's a super cold year. Um, and it was in Greenland, um, in Zakenberg, which is in the north uh, eastern side of Greenland. They have a field site that they've been just studying the plants and the birds and animals there for 20, 25 years. And it was one of the coldest and most snowy years. And they basically had a reproductive failure across the board um, because the, the nest fledging, the nests were initiated late, and then there wasn't much. There were a few. Um, uh, um, uh, fledglings so it was a complete failure for that year all across so that's kind of the opposite to what you expect but that's some of the signatures we're seeing of climate change where um you know you have these super cold years thrown in there um that can really throw a, a, a spanner of a wrench in the no, works right yeah um and I, I um but i don't know that we have a good handle on so you know um we think it could happen because all of the species are responding differently right so you know the seed if the fruits so the fruits are dispersing their seeds about two days per decade up in the arctic because the temperatures at the end of the growing season are increasing more than at the beginning um, and so are those now dispersing their seeds too early to feed the migratory birds before they head south for example there's a lots of questions around that that we don't know fully the answer about yeah yeah good thank you it's um okay nick one more question <laughs> <laughs> you were mentioning that the warming up there is happening in the cold season yeah and on glider island that's exactly what we find we find that the warming is happening in the cold season. all right yes mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes yeah Okay, it's almost nine o'clock, so I think we'll end it here. So please, if, and if you have more questions, you can always come up and ask Zoe. Um, but anyway, please help me in thanking Zoe for an amazing... <laughs>